I'm delighted that uh, today's meeting uh, we have as a speaker speaking today in a private capacity, uh, Professor Michaela Benson, who's also a member of New Europeans, who's going to uh, tell us about the situation and the challenges still faced by British citizens in the EU EEA. Thank you very much, Roger. So um, I'm going to jump straight in. So I'm going to be talking about the challenges relating to citizens' rights that face British citizens living in the EU and EEA. And I want to start here by echoing something that my colleague Charlotte O'Brien um, said in her presentation to the APPG when she was talking about the challenges facing EU citizens in the UK. She stressed that there were considerable risks ahead. And I'd like to highlight that this is also true of British citizens living in the EU uh, and EEA, but this is multiplied by 27 member states and, and of course the EEA states as well. In the face of those who are saying that Brexit is done, I want to stress that this is only the beginning of things for British citizens who were living in the EU before Brexit. So why does it matter that we're looking at 27 different countries? Well, it matters because each of these countries is responsible for implementing citizens' rights provisions in relation to their resident Brits. And so they have been coming up with domestic solutions to the problem of Brexit. And more than that, this has often been devolved to a local level. So we have municipal offices in local regions and areas trying to um, accommodate the implementation of citizens' rights, which is fundamentally different from the way that it's been managed in the UK, I would stress, where it's been centralised through the EUSS. So what this means really in terms of thinking about the challenges is that in the case of British citizens living in the EU, it's going to be even more of a challenge to keep an eye on the challenges that people are facing going forwards. Now, before I move on to five headlines about the future challenges, I want to stress that the population of British citizens living in the EU is for the most part of working age and below. It's something in the region of 80% of that population. And it's as diverse as the British population living in the UK. It includes children in care, vulnerable and chronically ill adults, as well as young people in precarious employment. And I state this here because there is a common misconception that all Brits in the EU are retired and elderly. And this leads to a consideration of a very narrow, if nonetheless incredibly important, set of issues, which are not representative of the broader issues that are faced by that broad population. So in accounting for the challenges, my presentation is going to have to be very broad brush, because as I said, 27 states, a very diverse population. The five headlines that I'm going to focus on today are the implementation gap, the future shift from temporary to permanent resident status, the impact of um, a future lack of monitoring, democratic representation, support and advocacy for British citizens in the EU, the issues concerning that British citizens who might at some, sorry, the issues concerning some British citizens who might at a future date want to return to the UK and onward movement rights within the EU. So the first of these, the implementation gap. For the last few years, I and others have been warning that despite the agreements reached and the rollout of implementation, there were always going to be people who fall between the gaps. This is something that will disproportionately impact on the vulnerable within the population. But also as we started to hear, and we may hear shortly from Debbie and Clarissa, it also impacts on those who are extremely well integrated socially and economically in the places they live. And I include among those British children who have been raised almost exclusively in EU countries, who have kind of lived their lives alongside EU citizen national children um, and are not, are not really aware, don't, don't really live in that universe where they might have been considering Brexit as, as an issue um, relating to their future employment and, and various other things. Now, I signal these two sides of the story of the people who might fall between the gaps, who may as yet have failed to get their residence permits, because I think that this signals some of the problems with the ways in which the local implementation, implementation was communicated and the networks within which people were working to move that, that information out. We can see, for example, when we look at the statistics about the numbers of application for new residence status, so that's the withdrawal agreement residence permits, 
among British citizens in the EU. Included in the latest, and I would stress final report from the Specialised Joint Committee on Citizens' Rights, but we can already see there's, there's, there's a bit of a shortfall in terms of the estimates of British citizens living in most member states and the uptake uh, of these applications. And it's particularly alarming when we look at those countries who chose to operate what's called a declaratory system, where people who had existing residence permits as EU citizens um, were required to swap those in for new statuses. To be honest, at the moment, when we're talking about an implementation gap, we don't really know how many people this might include. And it could take years and even decades to see the fallout from a change in status like this, as we saw in the case of the Windrush generation in the UK. But I think it's important that we anticipate what the potential consequences of this might be for those who are unregistered in consequence of Brexit and undocumented in their place of residence. Now, as I said, this is broad brush and the consequences are going to vary from country to country, depending on what access to what uh, is, um, sorry, depending on what the residence permit gives access to or not. So a very, very simple example is that in some countries, in order to access healthcare, you may need a residence permit, while in others, you might not. So you can see that in a country where you need a, a residence permit in order to access healthcare, um, that it might come to light pretty quickly that you are unregistered. Whereas in a situation where you're not required to produce such documentation, it's gonna take a lot longer and there could be uh, potential impacts down the line. So I'm gonna move over to this, um, this future shift from temporary to permanent status. We can also see from the statistics that there are a significant number of people who in the next five years are going to need to reapply for permanent residence. And in France, which is the second largest population of British citizens in the EU, it looks like this is going to be more than 50,000 people who are going to need to go through that process. I'd stress that this transition in terms of status is another flashpoint where people could fall between the gaps and individualized deadlines leave it up to the individual to secure their future status. So we can. So the question in my mind is what will happen if people let these lapse? Are we going to end up with a greater number of people who are undocumented? Um, and yet, we also don't know what the process for this is going to be in each of the member states yet. That hasn't been communicated. Or what happens if people undergo changes in their lives in the meantime, from their employment status to marriage to having children? And that links to my next point. One of the successes, uh, well, I don't, I don't know whether success is the right word, but what we saw over the last few years um, was, you know, monitoring of what was happening, a little bit of democratic representation, some support and advocacy uh, for British citizens living in the EU. But going forwards, the future looks a bit bleak. There is no independent monitoring authority for British citizens who live in the EU. What we're faced with is discreting, decreasing scrutiny of the implementation of their rights there are not going to be any more joint specialised committees and the implementation is going to be reported only annually. If we pair this with the limited de um, democratic representation of British citizens in the EU, where they don't have democratic representation in their states of residence or at EU, rep or at EU level, and in a lot of cases no longer in the UK because they lost their rights to vote because they've been out of the country for too long, then we can start to see that this is looking pretty bleak. The support funds that the British government rolled out have now closed. And this week saw the closure of British in Europe, the largest umbrella organization of British citizens living in the EU, who really spearheaded the advocacy for British citizens living in the EU. So without all of this, who should British citizens in the EU turn to? And I think that's a really, really urgent question that we need to address. Now, my final two points, I'm just going to run over very, very quickly. Some of the issues that British citizens returning to the UK are facing include whether in the future, after the seven year grace period, British children will be eligible for home fees at universities. Now, there has been a grace period agreed, but we also know that a lot of universities are not even aware of this provision and so have been charging British children from the EU international fees. The issue of returning to the UK with non-UK spouses is something that's concerning lots of people or non-UK family members. 
from the end of March, British citizens returning to the UK with such relations will have to go through immigration controls, just like anybody else bringing independent family members. I'd also like to flag a possibility that we might need to look at what challenges returning British citizens face in accessing welfare, uh, benefits, et cetera. And I'm sure that this is something that Pilar, who I can see is here, might have more information on um, from her research with people repatriating at this point in time. And my final point uh, around the movement rights within the EU. I don't know whether people are very well aware, but the rights under the withdrawal agreement only um, uh, do not permit onward movement within the EU. They relate to people in their country of residence at that point in time. And as Debbie, I think, is going to discuss, that's created some problems for people who work across borders, among other things. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Clarissa and Debbie, who are going to share a little bit with you about the human face of this.